when one of these parties dies, his portion is distributed amongst the remaining members of the joint tenants. All right? Very key you understand that concept. There are several questions that ask about <clears throat> putting a joint tenant in a will. You cannot do that. When B dies, his interest does not go into a will. It is not a willable interest because by definition of a joint tenant, it would go to the remaining survivors. So in the example that I now see on the board, what happens is B dies, oops, their interest now each goes to 33 and a third because there's now only three remaining survivors, all right? And we can continue to play this game. I'm going to do it this way differently. B died. So now you've got 33 and a third. Then let's say C passes away. And once again, as a member of the joint tenant, his interest goes to the remaining survivors. So what you have now is two survivors left who each have 50%. All right, because now there's just two of them. In essence, it just removes one of the owners. The same amount of interest is there. It's just now divided by less owners. And let's play the game further on down the road. When D passes away, A now owns the property 100%. And he owns it how? Hit pause and think about it. How does A now own the property? A owns the property in severalty. He is now the sole owner of the property. He won the game, so to speak. All right? So now A can treat his property like normal mom and pop. Now, A can put it in his will because he was the sole survivor. And he would leave it to four more grandkids and do the same thing. He could put it on the market and sell it. He could give it to his brother to work. It doesn't matter because A now owns the property in severalty as one owner. All right? So that is the joint tenant process uh, as of a co-ownership. Those are the two ways that you would take co-ownership of a property. Now, there is a legal way to terminate this. This It is called partitioning. So let's go over here. And I'm going to redraw that picture this time this way because it's a little easier to see. Wish I knew how to draw a circle. That would be better. Oh, well, that might be the way to do it. <clears throat> Let's see if it'll let me do this. Yeah, I'll be darned. So I want to draw it as a circle because here you've got A, B, C, and D. They each own 25% interest. They are joint tenants, so by definition, right of survivor plays. This I'm just redrawing what we just had. And let's say I'm going to make up a game here. D does not want to be involved in the farm. Grandfather left the farm to the four grandkids as joint tenants. And D doesn't really want to be involved, all right? Now, once again, here's a scenario that I need you to know and understand for the exam. I will tell you this happened in this case. This is where I'm getting the example from. 
But in the real world, what would really happen is the judge would intervene in this. And let me go through this example, and then I'll tell you what happened. So let's say D says, look, guys, I don't want to be involved in the farm. I want out. Well, under joint tenants, which was decided by his grandfather, he cannot sell his property because joint tenants have right of survivorship. They can go through a very messy court case called partition or partitioning. Where in essence, he is going to partition his interest out. And what he is going to do is then tell the brothers, hey man, our cousin I'm going to sell to because he wants to work the farm. So after his interest gets partitioned out, it can now be treated like regular mom and pop real estate. D could sell that interest to their cousin. He could give it away. He could do whatever, all right? The key part component here that I want you to understand is because D sold his property to a new owner, E came in at a different time, right? So this section here, time, I said they all four had to get it at the same time or all five or all two, whatever they do it, has now been broken because E got his at a newer time. So in essence, what you have is A, B, and C are still joint tenants. Their function did not get broken up. But together as a group, they are tenants in common with letter E because he came in at a new time, and therefore that broke joint tenants. A, B, and C still act like that. So now let's play the game. Let's say A passes away. Well, his interest still goes to the remaining survivors of the joint tenants. But now there's only two remaining survivors, and they only have 75% total. So what happens, his portion gets divided between the remaining members. And now what you have are these two guys that have 37.5%. And E still only maintains 25% because he is not part of the joint tenants. The second D sold out, E is not a part of the joint tenants, all right? And we can play the game even further. So now, let's say B dies. His interest actually goes to the remaining survivor of the joint tenant, which is C, who now owns 75%. E still remains at 25, and what you see on the screen here, this whole thing in general, should look exactly like that. So I've pro proven to you that it is now tenants in common, because what you have are two tenants. You've got two tenants, C, and D, they have disproportional interests. They've got their interests at different time, and the only thing they share is possession of the farm. That, by definition, is the tenant in common. All right? So back to what I was saying. A, B, and C... are still 
joint tenants. But together, they are a tenant in common with a new tenant. That is called partitioning. It is a very tough court case because it's hard to divide the interest. In the case I was involved in, the judge literally told the four grandsons, he's like, look, you guys go out in the hallway, make a deal, buy your brother out. Or if you come back in here to me, I'm going to force the sale of the property, the entire thing, and then you guys can just split the money and go your own separate ways. All right? So it can be done. I mean, I've seen a judge threaten to do that. And literally, they went out in the hallway. They came up with a, a plan to buy their brother out, so there was only going to be three owners out of the gate. All right? So partitioning is a way of breaking that out <clears throat> through a suit for partition right here. Okay? Now, there is a very special type of joint tenants for married people. It is called tenants by the entirety. Tenants by the entirety. What this is, is when a man and a woman are legally married. They are seen as one unit. All right? Let's see if I can get video aids. If one of them were to die, the unit still is there. All right? The unit still is there. So when one spouse passes away, their interest becomes the other interests to the other party. If the husband dies, the wife now owns the house. If the wife dies, the husband owns a house. Because they are a joint tenant, they are just seen as one unit. It is called tenants by the entirety. In states that use tenants by the entirety, both spouses have an interest in the property. So if there was ever going to be a listing to sell that property, both spouses have to sign off on that. Both spouses would sign on the deed to transfer the title. A husband cannot sell the house out from underneath his wife. Conversely, a wife could not sell the house out from underneath her husband. It takes both parties in those type of situations, all right? So keep an eye on that when you're dealing with married couples and listing houses. If both names are on it or the state you're working in happens to use tenants by the entirety, you're going to need both signatures on that, all right? Now, when a couple is married, and we have touched on this once before slightly, when a couple gets married and they buy property, every state in the United States uses this thing called community property, meaning both parties own it, all right? So if property is acquired during the marriage, it becomes community property. And if anybody's out there has ever been divorced, don't raise your hand, <laughs> you know that you, you guys, we all joke about it, you split you, you split all the assets, all right? You split the assets, and usually the wife gets all the good stuff and the husband gets all the bills. <laughs> That's the split. <laughs> um, spouses are considered equal partners, and both properties, both signatures are required to convey any property acquired during the marriage with community property. Now, one of the other things that we had touched on was those states, there are some states that work as what they call individual states or separate property states. Separate property states, depending on what state you live in. Indiana is a separate property state. I believe Florida is. I believe, uh, well, there's actually only nine uh, community property states. In your book, on page 54, there's a list. Arizona, California, Idaho, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, Washington, and Wisconsin are what they call community property states. 
in a community property state, when a couple get married, both spouses throw all of their assets into that marriage, and then should that marriage dissolve, it gets evenly split. So anything prior to the marriage becomes potentially half the other person's in a community property state. In states that are separate property, like Indiana, there are three, what a separate property state means is this. In separate property states, whatever you bring to the marriage before you were married would be yours after the marriage, all right? So if you had a car, you got married and then got divorced, the car that you brought to the marriage that was yours in separate would be yours after the marriage. You would pull that out of the assets and go, no, that was mine. <clears throat> Anything willed or gifted even during the marriage is separate property, all right? Once again, I, I know we've talked about this and this is a better time to rehash it. This is how heirlooms are kept in families. You know, grandmother gives the diamond ring to her daughter through the will, even though the daughter's married at the time, it is considered separate property. And should they get divorced, that ring would come out and the wife would go, no, that is not an asset to be split because it's mine. It was will to me. Therefore, it comes out of the assets. Now split the rest. All right. The third thing would be any money that is earned by separate property. So what I mean by that is suppose your grandmother wills you a rental property. That rental property would be separate property if you were in a separate property state because it was willed to you. That rent that gets earned is also separate property because it's coming from other stuff that was willed to you, which would be declared as separate property. Now, don't confuse that with my wife and I bought a rental while we were married. That's a whole different story. So understand that money earned by the key there is separate property. And that separate property was given to you through a will or a gift, even though you were married. Or you owned that rental before you were married. That's another potential. If I owned a rental property, then got married, the income from that is also separate property. That's what I'm saying here. So those are what we call separate property and community property. Are we good? If not, go back, rewatch everything we're talking about uh, because it could be kind of confusing to some people. Now, the third way to own a property is through this thing called a trust. A trust is a legal entity that is considered a separate person, all right? Now, what I want to do is take a minute and take a sidebar and talk about something that you're going to see in your career throughout the rest of this book and throughout your career. <clears throat> 